Welcome back to the Popperian Podcast, the podcast where we look into the life and the work of the philosopher Karl Popper. And on today's podcast, we have a very important guest and a guest I've been trying to get to for a long time. I should say, um, in my very first podcast, I spoke to David Deutsch, and um, he won't mind me saying that afterwards. I asked who he recommends I speak to as soon as possible, and he mentioned this person's name as the first one on his list. And so it's a shame on me that's taken me almost a year to organize the podcast. So this is Rafe Champion. Rafe, welcome to the podcast. Well, I'm very, very pleased to be here and excited to hear that David Deutsch recommended me. He was, it was the first name out of his mouth. So, um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, again, an embarrassment on my behalf for not getting around to it soon enough. Um, we're going to talk about um, Popper's institutional turn and it will, his social turn in some ways. And then we're going to make, you know, a whole bunch of fun diversions into how science works. Um, as a start, though, I, I should ask you about your background, because it is uh, in some ways an unconventional background, but not so unconventional for Popper, because, you know, many people that do come into Popper and find him are, are not um, strictly philosophers or academically trained philosophers. So tell me about your background and, and how you found Popper as well. Yeah, well, it's a very typical Popperian type of background. I, I grew up, I went through actually through a, a church boarding school I uh, had great ideas about getting involved in solving the world hunger problem because I grew up on a farm and I thought I'd study agricultural science and then work with some international agency. Uh, so I started doing an agricultural science degree and got six years along the road, well towards a PhD, when I realised the problem wasn't about producing food, it was about a whole host of political, philosophical, religious, cultural, economic issues, so I abandoned agricultural science and turned to sociology. And on the way, in fact, one of my, my thesis supervisor, when I told him I was leaving to do sociology, the next very next day brought in, holding in his hands, the poverty of historicism and the open society and its enemies. Uh, so I got, that was my introduction to social sciences, was Karl Popper, the open society. Did you ever meet Popper personally? Or I, I'm sure, I, I think I've read a few times you've had interactions with him. Did you ever meet him personally? Yes, I wrote a letter when Bertrand Russell died. Uh, it was no, people said I replied to every letter that he ever received. And of course, Bertrand Russell was a sort of patron saint of secular humanists. And I, and I was terribly sorry I hadn't written Bertrand Russell a lesson. So I thought I'd better write one to Karl Popper immediately. So he wouldn't die before I wrote him a letter. <laughs> and he wrote back in a very friendly way. And he sent me a bundle of off prints of the papers, which sh shortly after appeared in Objective Knowledge, uh, the papers that he delivered during the 1960s on Objective Knowledge. And then when I went to England in 1972, he said I should come and visit him. So I did. I visited his country home uh, in Penn in not far from Hoy Wickham. And uh, how, how, how did you find him? A lot of people always, I'm smiling as I say this, a lot of people seem to have this, um, these memories of Popper as being an incredibly difficult person. And then you bumped into always some people who think, who say, you know, he was the most charming, open guy who listened to me intently. So how, what was your, how did you find him? Oh, well, he was absolutely charming with me because I wasn't any kind of professional threat or was, and I admired him and this and that. But the amusing thing was, he said, "Come to the, come, get on the train to High Wycombe, uh, and I'll be there, and I'll have a copy of the BBC Listener under my arm, uh, so the platform might be thronged with Central Europeans." At Two thirty on a Friday, Wednesday afternoon. Anyway, I caught up with him, and Jeremy Sherman told me later, when he got to the station, he found that he had left the BBC Listener at home. <laughs> So he went to the kiosk to buy a replacement, but they had sold out. So he bought a copy of the London Times, which is a broadsheet, and he folded that up two or three times to get it down to the size of the BBC listener and put that under his arm. But he actually was the only person on the platform. So, so lucky enough. That was pretty funny. <laughs> 
So uh, I mean, just before we do get in, into some of the content here, I, I must ask you, did you find, beyond uh, a personal fascination with the philosophy itself, did you find the philosophy useful to your own um, life and your uh, and your own work outside of the issue? Because there's always some interesting stories, people like John Eccles always say, you know, you read about them and they say things like, um, read and pop was, was the great step forward, or you opened so many avenues to my work that I hadn't seen before. So did you find him useful beyond just the, the, the academic philosophical interest? Well, insofar as I was con- deeply involved with ideas for social reform and also ideas about the growth of knowledge, thinking that you know, the growth of knowledge is, will save us one way or another, if anything can. Uh, so it, it fed into both of those two strands of my interest into the so- social reform uh, I must say I was thinking on very Popperian lines before I read his work in detail. And in fact, people who read some of my juvenile, juvenile essays, one of them said, gee, you, you should be reading uh, The Poverty of Historicism and The Open Society and His Enemies. And at that stage, I was in a sort of bullshit frame of mind. I made a resolution not to read those books. I wanted to do my own thinking. Uh, but anyway, when I, when I read them, I found that Popper anticipated everything I might have thought. So I became, I guess, more of a dis- disciple, uh, which was not congenial, really, except that the ideas are so good that I didn't see the need to improve them. I- so that's launch into the content we're going to speak about today, which is um, the social turn or the institutional turn of Popper's work. And, um, you know, I, I, as I speak, I'm basing a lot of this on, on an article of yours on Gordon Tullock's book, which you mentioned and I found so interesting, and on your book, Reason and Imagination. And also for the podcast, I trolled through your website again, which I do quite often called The Rat House. And I found a, a, a quote or at least a paraphrasing of David Deutsch and he describes science. And I thought this was an interesting way to start this discussion when you speak about the organization of science. And this is you paraphrasing Deutsch, and I'll paraphrase you here. He, he talks about an imaginary seminar where all the participants are scientists. And of course, they're all from different parts of the world with different statuses within the community and different hum, you know, levels of education and proficiency. So, um, and he imagines looking in on this and as you look in, you, you, it's very hard to see if there's any hierarchy involved. There's really no, um, there's no ego involved. There's no snipping and backfighting. There's nothing to imagine what the hierarchy exists. And then the, um, the seminar ends and they go for dinner and then someone brings up the topic of the weather or some other gossip. And immediately they all become deeply dogmatic and prejudiced and pride comes out and they have their loyalties are exposed and even they begin threaten each other and or flattering each, each other. And then someone at the table changes the topic back to a scientific issue of the day. And immediately all that pretend strips away again and they're all equal suddenly and there's no ego in the room. And that is an, a, a glorified in some ways view of science. And I'm going to start there and ask you, is that how you see science having worked in it? Is that how we should see science? Or is David well, Deutsch the, being too grand here? That's the type of science where, where I was living uh, pretty well 50 years ago at a, a, a agricultural centre of excellence uh, World leaders came and went, and I got to have drink with them in the pub and just took, stood beside their benches and discussed their work and this and that. And that was the way things were working in that milieu. Uh, slightly, obviously, idealised because bits of pieces of spite and ego turned up in funny ways, but that's just human nature. But I think that that is. 50 years ago, and times have changed drastically in the scientific community under the influence of a whole suite of factors that I've listed some. There's about 20 factors of sociological and philosophical kinds, including the rise of normal science. There's so many. These were all elite scientists I'm talking about, and the ethos was all about the growth of knowledge. But those 
leading scientists have now been diluted by large numbers of normal scientists who Tullock referred to as the people who are paid to pay, they're basically there to make a, to, to pay the rent. Uh, there's no drive to advance the frontier of knowledge. And that just plays into normal science. It's like a fit like a glove with normal science. I, I believe um, Tullock used the phrase um, um, induced curiosity. And he also had two other parameters, um, pure curiosity or implied, um, so pure science and applied science. So how should we view this enterprise of science as a whole? Because it, there, there's, a, there's a, a name that everyone seems to run off their lips when they, you know, science comes out of the mouth so quickly these days. And yet it is in so many ways, a whole number of different things. So um, what is the difficulty we have in describing science? Yeah, well, I touched on that in my review of, of the, those two books, because so, science, this is a problem of winning the words, but you have to define, uh, so science can mean, uh, it can mean a body of knowledge, which is the science of physics. Uh, it can mean uh, science as a whole, which is a whole gigantic scientific enterprise of all the subjects and all the disciplines and all the universities and institutes. Uh, it, it can mean uh, what's been settled in some particular area of science, like that's the settled science. Um, and that's it. it. So it just means so many. And then you've got normal science, which is people who just puddle along doing what they're told. Uh, you've got great science or you know, path breaking science, which is the, the leaders of the field. And science gets applied to all of these different things. So you really need, it's like, when I was thinking about this interview, I thought, well, at some point I'm going to have to talk about doing a check on the problem. Like, what what a, what particular aspect of this great um, mass of entities and things, what, what particular aspect do, do we really want to talk about? Um, or what, what, and Popper's social turn actually is particularly helpful to, to get away from the idea that Popper was just talking about an idealised type of platonic ideal of science and Kuhn was the man who really told it like it is. Uh, and that's really not fair to either Kuhn or Popper, actually, because Popper was very well aware of normal science, even though in response to Kuhn, his father stupidly said that he'd learn an awful lot about normal science from Kuhn. I think I was just buttering up, I think, but... So Popper knew quite well that there was a lot of conformity and what he called it conventionalism. Um, so Popper had his foot on each in each camp. He's concerned to talk about the way science should be done, and he's prepared to look at the way that it was being done. And the way it is done is a matter of, of conventions and, institu and institutions. It's the conventions you pick up to become what Polanyi called your implicit knowledge. And the institutions are what provide your incentives and motivation, like the way you have to pass exams or the way you have to angle to get tenure or the, or the way you have to go after grants to do research. So you have to really be clear which particular, how, which particular phase uh, of the scientific activity you're addressing at any particular moment. Well, let's, let's get into another one of those problems, and I think this will take us towards the, the centre of this social turn and institutional turn in Popper's work. And that is this, um, I, I believe I, I read this somewhere, this is almost going to be a, a complete quote, this mythical idea of the individual scientist um, deeply impartial, just pursuing pure truth and, and science rests on the backs of these individuals. And that idea is one of the, it appears to be one of the problems that Popper is trying to um, disabuse us of, one of the, brought the illusions you try and disabuse us of. Yes, he's, there's a, several, he's got several lines of attack on that. One is he says, there will, he's a criticism of what he called Robinson Crusoe science, where you, a, a single isolated person is working away. But he says, well, that won't work because I'll, get, I'll be getting no critical feedback from anyone. Now, that's a bit, that's not, anyway, that, that's one line. But his other, another line is, he said, well, if you depended on the Olympian detachment of scientists, 
uh, and you look at the history of science, which actually Kersler did a lot of, he, said, he says there's, there's no sectarian dispute that is more acrimonious and uh, emotional than the pursuit and the activities of some of the great scientists, I mean, their, their great feuds and their obsession with priority. Um, Einstein seems to be a bit of an exception to that. He might get close to the platonic ideal, maybe. But, but uh, no, there's, there's been really human nature came out very strongly in the in the in the leading scientists, uh, and that's where the proper gets back to the community. That it's it's the interaction in the community that, that provides whatever detachment and objectivity you can ever get. Don't don't depend on psychology of the individual to get it. Does this object this does this um this focus on the social community as the source of objectivity and impartiality does it run throughout all of Popper's work? Because as you mentioned in your article and as Ian Jarvie does in his work, um, this is seems to be a, a, a overlooked aspect of Popper's work. Well, the, the, reason that, the reason it's overlooked is that people read the logic of logic to Forshung and then later logic of sign of discovery they read it to see what he was saying about demarcation and induction. And that was what it's like. You see what you're looking for. They weren't looking. They just didn't read it. But, but as Jarvie found, it's, it's there as plain as you like when you actually see it. It's like the, the pattern in a carpet. Uh, one minute you don't see it, then you suddenly it's, it's obvious. Uh, and it wasn't, probably wasn't that obvious to Papa. It probably had to... Like he used to say, well, you, you never really know what you're talking about because you're always saying there's always content there that you weren't aware of, which is a by accident. Um, yeah. mm. that, 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 I find that very interesting. I think at some point in your article, you used the phrase snow blindness to refer to Popper's, um, into the fact that Popper may have, have been so close to his own theory that he didn't properly appreciate this important detail as much as he should have or could have. Well, this is pervasive, and it's simply because we all are greater or lesser extent blinkered. We, we just see what's in front of us. And the snow blindness was a phrase that Arthur Kersler used in relation to one of the great pioneers, Kepler or Copernicus, or someone that they made a massive breakthrough. And then theoretically, they could have gone right on to get to Newton's theory, but they just stopped where they were. And it took someone else from, from looking from the side or coming along later to take it the next step, uh, as though this, we have great difficulty developing things very far. And Joe Agassi had a, wrote a paper about creativity. So one type of creativity is just taking any idea and just developing all of its implications, just unpack everything that's in it. Uh, and that might you might lead to a very exciting and creative discovery in it. It almost looks mechanical because you start with a common garden idea, but when you unpack it, uh, it might have all sorts of content. But that was the thing with Popper. That idea of the social turn had so much content, but he never developed it. He thought he had other interests. He, it took Jarvie to come along and explain it. It took Jarvie 10 years to work it out. He's working on that book all through the 1990s. Um, and so you have to cut Popper some slack that he was concerned about quantum theory, he was getting into a, um, evolutionary theory, and he's all the time going, still working on probability theory and his propensity theory, and probably still fiddling with verisimilitude and answering his correspondence and all those other things you have to do <laughs> in the course of a day. Um, that's... Very early on in your article, you you um, you talk about Popper and uh, an incident, um, a counterintuitive procedure of kind that he took in the poverty of historicism. And I think that I might open the floor up to you here and get you to to open this up. But I think this is an important way to do it. And instead of telling us um, how progress in science would be best um, achieved, he t instead turns it around and tries to imagine the conditions under which progress would be halted and stopped altogether. So what would, if you were trying to shut down the growth of science and the growth of knowledge, what would you do? Well, that was written uh, 
published in 1957. It could have been in the original article that was published in 1944. So I don't know if you wrote it in 1944 or sometime be just before 1957. But anyway, uh, what he described there has actually happened. But all of those things that she described there are now happen have happened. And you can see it. It's there in front of us now where uh, he said, well, you close, you close down the journals or you, you, put, you drastically restrict freedom of speech. Well, the journals haven't been closed down, but they're now run by cliques uh, of particular kinds so that certain ideas that are out of fashion with the clique uh, don't get published or they get published in lesser uh, journals that aren't regarded as primary, primary sources. Um, what else? Freedom of speech was his biggest thing, but closing down the journals and the laboratory, government control was a big part of it. The government could do a great deal, or well, the government could do all of these things, and then to some extent, the gov governments have done these things. Um, and so you can just see that what Popper said would stop the growth of knowledge has now been put in place. Why, 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 why do you think that's happening in the world? Surely um, um, it, it, um, the growth of knowledge. I mean, you, there are certain groups out there that, that thinks it's, still think it's quite fashionable to say we, we, we should slow this down and halt the growth of knowledge. But um, increasingly, I would have thought governments would be on board to grow this as fast as possible. So why do you think um, those, that horror story that Popper painted, it seems to be happening? Well, I, I, I I wrote a paper where I sketched out and listed about 20 factors that I called it joining the dots to see what what things, well, among the dots, there were things like the growth of big science funded by big government. Uh, if you go back to the time that Popper was first writing that in the 30s and 40s, uh, the government component of scientific research was very modest. There were, um, the whole scientific enterprise was very modest in terms of the numbers of people involved. And the sources of funding were quite diverse. Uh, in Australia, for example, our universities were funded by state governments, by fees, uh, and by industry grants, and, and also, and then it was completely taken over by the federal government. So the federal government decided they'd pay all of the costs of the universities. Uh, and, so all the, and so that immediately reduced the diversity of sources of funding. And, it, and also at the same time introduced a massive amount of bureaucracy uh, because there had to be some semblance of monitoring and control of how everything was done. Uh, but on, in the world scheme, the thing was that governments became overwhelmingly big funders of big science. Well, that, uh, at the same time, you get, a, you get the rise of normal scientists or scientists who simply are there to, to work from nine to five with induced curiosity as opposed to the burning desire to advance the frontier of knowledge. Um, and then you get the politicisation of science. That could have crept in slowly uh, I suppose through the 50s. I mean, politics must have always been an influence, but it just became a much more overt and obvious influence uh, up to the present time where there's the whole vogue of um, political quickness and the cancel culture has camped on the campuses. So there's a kind of an unprecedented, well, maybe you go back to the Middle Ages, you might find draconian controlled on free speech. But in our lifetime, this thing's this draconian control has manifested itself in on the campuses of the Western world uh, to a point where the, the most hard, the hard, probably the hardest place in society to generate open discussion on certain topics would be in the university precincts.
So I, I, this, this is really interesting to me, and it brings a lot of um, thoughts back to Talek's book, The um, Organization of Inquiry, which you mentioned a lot here. And um, what do you imagine um, some of the solutions to this to be? I mean, Talek goes into his book and talks a lot about the need for um, um, the, these pull factors for um, um, scientific investigation rather than push factors, motivation in terms of um, prestige or awards. Or even he offers a, a certain thought in terms of funding, which is something along the lines of, and he says it slightly tongue in cheek, if someone had had offered a billion dollars for so-and-so invention, it would have been done a lot sooner and a lot quicker and with a lot less fuss. So, um, and and we all know in some way that there's some truth to this, you know, as soon as you, you're, if, if you can motivate someone to, to, to get somewhere, you know, with a, 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 a pull factor rather than a push factor, it does seem to work. And so I wonder what you would do if you, if you had the control of the system. Well, that's a little bit like the old Irish joke about the man who said, asked someone in the, in the, on the road how to get to Dublin from here. And the man says, well, if I was going to Dublin, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> uh, just, if you ask me how to reform education or the universities or scientific research, I'd say, oh, well, I want to go back to where I was 50 years ago uh, because I thought you could re- didn't need that much reform then. It could have just gone on the way it was. <laughs> so how do we get, get it back to where it was 50 years ago? And I don't know how. But one way, one way and this is what I can do, is to... Trying and is to, is to keep alive the thought of Karl Popper. The better, bearing in mind, has to be subjected to criticism, and he made mistakes, and verisimilitude was one of them. Um, but my my role in all of this is just to keep alive the Popperian on well, yours too. Is to keep alive the legacy of Popper, the the legacy of particularly Popper's critical rationalism, the attitude that you. You might be right and I may be wrong, and with an effort we can get a better understanding. Now that that would be like a, ma- a magic formula that would solve, or, or would open up a, a, the gate to address so many of our, our problems. Uh, and that takes us down to the deep roots of justificationism and verificationism and inductivism. Uh, which... Well, that's... Um, I... We, I, I might hold our gunpowder on those issues, um, um, but I might ask you just then, you know, this idea of, of how can we you know, drill into this and get it to something incredibly functional and, and what we might want it to look like. Um, that, that's, let's begin um, talking about uh, the rules of science in a way, and this is more of a, well, I might get open up. It's what uh, Polanyi called tacit knowledge in a way, and it's this whole range of structures. So, some people have this idea of science that there are no rules to the game. I mean, this is famously what Farabin got into and says, you know, there, there is no method, there are no rules to this game. But th- 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 there does seem to be some, and there's some important ones in some ways. So um, what are the rules of the game and what should they be? Well, the primary one, I'd make critical rationalism the primary rule of the game. Uh, but, of course, Javi was looking at... the scientific investigation and I think the, the I should have the primary rule there was probably to make sure that no, no idea is protected screened off and, and quarantined from critical appraisal which in empirical science is pre- preeminently uh, testing or falsification but but more broadly and this is something that Popper got to when he got over, the prejudice against metaphysics that he sort of grew up with, he, he broadened the scope of criticism to anything and everything. Uh, it's just it, it, empirical tests don't apply on the metaphysical side of that line of demarcation, which incidentally is not a fixed line. It, it moves. It moves when technological advances mean you can test more things, that you, uh, better microscopes and stuff. But sorry, getting back to the rules. So the first one is to make sure that everything remains open for discussion as long as it needs to. And, and that, like, there are certain things you don't want to discuss forever. Uh, but so you have to just, so it's a matter of what are we, what are we going to discuss? What's, the pro, what's our problem today? What, what, what are we going to address this week? So 
is does the motivation matter here? And so again, thinking back to Talak a little bit, and as we you, you mentioned a few times, this idea of induced knowledge, and does 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 it fundamentally matter why someone seeks um, new knowledge in science? Not particularly, because as I conceded in my gloss on Talak, that great wonderful work can get done by people who work from nine to five. Uh, like you know, in fact, some of them. Uh, there's a description of Shannon, I think, as a great innovator in communication theory. I think he used to come in and work about 10 and go home at 3. So he didn't even work from 9 to 5. But the point is he was driven with fiery enthusiasm. He's probably thinking about it 24 hours a day. He just didn't work, spend much time in the office. No, the, the, um, it doesn't matter that much what your motivation is as long as you participate in the critical adventure, as long as you, you as long as you, you put in, you, you generate ideas and you contribute this criticism. And that's where the community comes in, I have to assume. So there, there's there's a point in this, um, and I, I, I it almost brings me back to a previous podcast I, I did with Jonathan Rausch, and this um, there's a, a way in which Popper begins to talk about this. I think Javi does too, where um, and I might, I might, I might be a little bit off here, so please correct me if I'm wrong. Of course, that it's it's just almost impossible, impossible being the wrong word, but almost impossible to to do the process of science as an individual. You need the community in some way. So why is it so hard as an as an individual to go through the processes of 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 critical rationalism and be this rational person? Put your own theories forward, test those theories, make them highly testable, um, try and be crit as critical as you can. Why is this so hard to do as an individual? Why do you need the community around you so much? Well, you, this is why Pop, Popper said it's, it's terribly important to generate public knowledge because our per, our personal knowledge is a, as a barely coherent stream of thoughts and impressions like some and you need to put stuff out either in in speech or better better than even in writing you sometimes have to do that to even find out what you're thinking i mean that that's you can be very confused in your thoughts and and then when you and then when you start to talk or write you, well, you have to put them into some kind of order. And once they're in, order, in that order, you and other people can look at them in a critical way. In other words, it's, it's next to impossible to be critical of what's going on in your own head. <laughs> so if, if you were to reform, for, for, for example, or to think about the journal system, and uh, so much for anyone that's not familiar with the journal system, the academic publishing system, it used to be this great enterprise. And everyone talks about peer review today has been this wonderful thing. But you, you, you could write any, any, any terrible article about any piece of nonsense with any fallacious references. And as long as you submit it to enough journals, you're probably going to find one somewhere that is going to publish it in some format, in some way. And if that doesn't work, you can always pay some dodgy journal to publish it for you. So um, it, these kind of these kinds of of enterprises, um, I, I think it was Talak again. At some point, he, he he says there is a certain amount of gatekeeping that happens within these places. They're not always as free and open as we'd want them to be. You know, so you, uh, same as 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 these conferences. We 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 tend to to dismiss known crackpots and we tend to accept uh, um, the speculative theories of, of high-ranking physicists as likely to be true in some ways. So uh, even in the best aspects of science, do we still find this, this, this constant error? Well, this actually reminds me of that theme, the theme about the open society that came up with our hair. Look, can we... Can we have a perfectly open society? Uh, well, the, the point about that is that, that the open society is just a, an ideal type, and closed society is not the, the corresponding ideal type. And no one would seriously suggest that there's probably there may never have been a completely closed society, and there'll certainly never be a completely open one. But the reason for drawing up the dichotomy is to just think in terms of what you could do to move in an appropriate direction where 
the appropriate direction would be to, in science, to have a, a more simultaneously open and critical process going on. And there's no point in trying to be utopian and saying, well, however we reform the whole system, it'd be just wonderful. Um, and that makes it very hard to talk about it because you come back to very incremental things that might be done. And one of them is, as you mentioned, is to have a very wide range of journals. So if you can't get into the top one where it's the most prestigious, you just go and spend, pay some money to some other one to publish your work. But the problem here is that there's too, there's too much being published. Um, and this was, I think, Popper's point, that there's just too many scientists there's too much money chasing not, a, not enough ideas. Um, and someone, just up a pro of climate science, someone pointed out that under the Clinton and Gore administration, the funding of climate science increased by a factor of 16. Now, the point is that when you have 16 times as much money going into a, a rather ill-defined and not particularly well or a very diffuse uh, kind of science and that money leaked out into all kinds of surrounding disciplines. So if you had social scientists and all kinds of other bandwagon people got, got onto the bandwagon of climate science, so there's a massive dilution of focus. So uh, in fact, Richard Lindzen, who's one of the better climate scientists, thought that the first thing you'd do would be just quite substantially reduce the flow of funds, would you just have less low quality static essentially being generated in the space. Uh, but that's not about to happen because it's, that's a, the politics, or as you point out, governments are all in favour of advancing science. If they think that science is going to be advanced by spending more money, as our government over here clearly thinks, they've been throwing money at every kind of innovation they can think of in the area of renewable energy. Uh, so th there's not going to be any shortage of money in the space. Uh, so you've got to think of some, <laughs> something else to, to improve the quality of the work. Well, let's touch on renewable energy. And then I think I might take a divergence into my our um, podcast with over here. But I might ask you about that because this touches on a lot of the problems with this, with our contemporary understandings of science. You often hear a lot um, phrases around, you know, scientific consensus says this, or uh, the, scienti the science is closed, the science is conclusive, the settled. science is settled. Or settled. Yeah. So please take us into why all of, at least that colloquial language is is so uh, off the mark. Well, the problem here, this was pinpointed by one of my heroes comparable to Karl Popper is Jacques Barzan, Barzan, yeah, French-born American man who lived from 19, 19, 1907 to 2012. He lived for, what's that, 90, 105 years. Uh, and he wrote a book, many books about education. And about 80 years ago, he wrote a wide ranging book looking at the way things were working. He said, the problem with American college education is that uh, you're supposed to produce people that have some knowledge of humanities and science before they start their professional education after two years of general studies. But in fact, the general studies course produces the science component produces two types of people. You have people who know nothing about science because those that preliminary work is so badly done. And you have the other type of scientist people are single track specialists. And because practically nobody in the community knows anything about science to speak of, it's practically impossible to get a decent public discussion going about any scientific topic. Uh, and there's manifestly the case with climate science where all of our politicians just say that science, we know, we, we look, the IPCC said this, therefore it's true, therefore the science is settled. Uh, and that's the end of it. You can't, you can't have any more discussion. 
But the problem is that I've just spent 10 years engaging with climate science, and that's after spending six years of a very strong science training like 50 years ago. Uh, and I'm approaching this not with a scientific background. I'm approaching this with hands-on experience with, with models, the type that climate scientists to use. And I'm approaching, and I'm talking now on the back of 10 years of engage, serious engagement with the literature. And it's quite clear that the science is not settled. Uh, the, the great majority of the better, more credible climate scientists are totally not alarmed. Uh, and, and that's just the map. That's just the way it is, as I see it. Uh, but you absolutely can't discuss this in public because nobody knows enough to get into any, anywhere into the debate. It's like it might as well be, be it might as well be quantum physics. Uh, when climate science is not rocket science, but it's, it's it's as inaccessible to lay people as quantum physics is. I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far, and I apologise for this brief interruption. But I will take this moment to briefly send out a plug for the podcast itself. The Popperian podcast is something that I've been planning for quite a while. And it's something that I want to keep running month to month. But to do so, it's going to need your help. If you're willing or able or interested, please go to the links below the podcast and support us however you can. It will be your help as listeners that keeps the podcast going and keeps the content coming out. And I thank you in advance. And with that said, we will now return to the second half of the interview. Thanks for listening. This might be a helpful way to step in. So you um, listened to my podcast with um, Anthony O'Hare and we talked about induction. And so this might be a way to open up the question of induction because you had a, a quibble with O'Hare that I might open up this way. So yeah. um, why why does this kind of um, um, inductive reference in a way not work? So, you know, you're sitting back as a layman on the subject and you see a statistic that says, I don't know what it is today, 93% of scientists agree that so that, 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 that this is likely to be true. And therefore, as someone you tend to assume from the outside that if this factor is repeating again and again and again, then, it is, then there is a probability that is true. And therefore, the reasonable thing to do is to accept uh, that repetition as representing truth. Well, that, that, yeah, that, that figure emerged from three different papers at different times. The one that I know best was written by an Australian, John Cook and Associates, and that's the canonical one. The 90, it's 97.4% of accredited climate scientists believe in warming. Uh, well, the problem... And then that was a, that was tweeted by Barack Obama in the run up to the, the Paris conference when they started getting serious about setting targets. But the problem there is that there's problems with the paper, the way the paper the research was done, the way they drew their sample, the way they analysed their results. Um, but the, the bottom line is that believing that we've got warming is no big deal because it's not a question of whether we've got warming. It's a question of whether we need to be alarmed about it. Uh, the warming that we've had since the, the Little Ice Age over the last 200 years, this has made us a very comfortable planet compared to the time when there were famines and plagues induced by freezing cold conditions. So the 97.4 is a gigantic myth, but it's, it's been so voraciously taken up and spread by so many voices uh, that it's just become canonical, but for no good reason. <laughs> it's very exasperating. Um, so in a more broader sense about inductivism, um, you, um, what is the... So I believe you, you mentioned in a brief e email to me um, the way in which it is possible in some ways to justify a preference for one thing um, rather than, um, you know, as, as a strong kind of inductivist uh, uh, want for something in some way. So you can have a preference for something, I believe you said car or theory or policy in a, in a way that doesn't um, need this kind of um, justificationist or, or inductivist um, underlying. Yeah, I think that 
I think that's a very fruitful line to take, and it it, it was foreshadowed by Popper a long time ago, where he just mentioned as an aside that you, you can you can justify a preference for one theory rather than another in a way that you can't justify a belief that any a particular theory is true. Uh, and I extended that actually to, to explain this to a room full of, of lay, lay people uh, where I used the analogy of buying a car to, you know, to, uh, because they, didn't, they weren't scientists. Uh, the problem with a strong type of justificationism is, um, well, ultimately it doesn't work. You have to admit there's still a residue of uncertainty uh, but the point is, from a working scientist's point of view, they have to decide, well, what, which experiment will we do next or which theory will we test next or which theory will we investigate? Because there's usually, well, there's almost inevitably more than one. Uh, so you're really looking about a, it's a competition or it's a matter of which of these theories deserves to survive or will or can survive critical appraisal. Um, but the justifications want to be, they just want to be, it's almost a religious quest to be, they want to be sure that they know something. Uh, do, like, do I exist or is this, do I, do I see a tree in front of me or not? Or is, is Newton's theory true? Well, Newton's theory was regarded as true by a great many people, but people in science knew that there were anomalies. Uh, it's a sort of a myth that Newton's got everything right. There were known anomalies, but there's no other theory around that could compete as well for, for, for breadth and depth until Einstein. So consequently, the, anom the, the anomalies just had to stand there as anomalies, uh, hoping that th they might either be worked out within the Newtonian framework, which some were, like the eccentric movement of the, of the planet that was resolved by finding another planet that was influencing it. Uh, okay, you got, you got some of these things resolved by discoveries uh, and others just sat and waited until Einstein turned up and found that his theory did better with some of those anomalies like the diffraction of the, you know, the rays around the sun, the one that they, the critical experiment that uh, people constantly referred to that, that justified Einstein ahead of Newton. Now, I imagine, I, I don't want to put words into over here's mouth, but I imagine if he were hearing this, he would say, but what do you do when you have two theories? Neither have been disproven, neither have been falsified. Um, both seem to explain the phenomena in terms of their testability and their empirical content and all the categories that would matter for a critical rationalist. But one is highly corroborated. One has been tested again and again and again. And one has never been tested or has only been tested a, a, a handful of times. So here, I'm assuming, would say that there is a reason to believe the highly tested theory, the highly corroborated theory, is more likely to be true in a way. Is is that a reasonable position to take or not? Well, it's, it's, it is. It's, it's, a, it's a, certainly it's a, a reasonable and a common and a, and a completely understandable and natural position. But, of course, this gets us to Popper's frequent locution that he doesn't believe in belief. Mm. Uh, we, okay, we have beliefs, but in science we're talking about public knowledge, which is spelled out in, or normally in writing. So Popper would say, well, there's theory A and there's theory B, and there's this track record of one of them, which has been tested many times, and then theory B is a, is a competitor. Uh, so where do we go from there? Well, the question is, what do we want to do? What's the, what, what, let's do a check on the problem. Uh, what's the problem here? Oh, okay, the problem is which one of these do we believe? Yeah. The answer is Popper doesn't believe either. He just says here's theory A, which has got these credentials, and here's theory B, which hasn't. But but so what what next? Do we want to develop theory B and bring out some of its content, or do we just want to ignore it? Uh, or or what? 
uh, it, it's not. So it is at this, mm, sorry, uh, it's it's at this point, I'm trying to channel an inductivist here and I'm struggling, but I'm just, <laughs> it, it, it's at this point where I think an inductivist would say um, what you have to do is um, is is choose a theory that not 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 um, you know hinge everything upon a theory that just isn't working in the world or anything al uh, along those lines. But you know um, there has there has to be a ground in in some way. So if you think ab ab about a provisional acceptance of a theory, you have to choose um, in some. It, even if you say I don't believe, there's some way in which a choice is still made in a way. And often the Popperians will say it's a provisional acceptance or something like this. And the inductivist's response tends to be that this is a this is a language game. Your provisional acceptance is what I think a belief is. Well, it, again, it, it's it's a, it's a what it's a, we do a check on the problem, mm. and we say, well, what 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 are we trying to achieve? Are we are we just are we uh, do we do we have what's the why do we have to choose one theory or the other? Uh, are we choosing it with a view to applying it for some technical purpose? Are we choosing it because we want to do some critical tests with it, or are we choosing it because we just want to put it in a textbook and say, well, this is the science of the time? Uh, to which the answer is, of course, you don't have to. You could put other rival theories in as well. You don't have to just put one theory. So it really comes back to what is the purpose of making a choice of theory A or B or C or D? And Pop was all in favour of having more than one theory. He said, well, okay, there's a big bang theory and a steady state theory. What's the problem? Let, let them just go along and be tested and compared. Uh, and why not have a third one if someone dreams one up? It's, 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 there's, a, what, there's something here that I think Lakatos called the obsession with instant rationality where we mm. have to an instant answer like which theory is it then and the answer is well unless it's okay if you've got if you're standing in the road with a car coming at you you have to decide whether to jump to the left or right you need an instant decision there but in well, science mm. you, you don't normally need to make instant decisions to about to accept a theory, you might say, well, we'll just keep working on this theory and see how it goes. Uh, you just preempted my next question as in still in this in channels and inductivist. What do you do? Uh, there are multiple, multiple moments when you have to make a choice in, in some, and not has to be, you know, jump out of the way of a car. The famous one is, is do I jump off the, this building and you have a theory that if I hit the ground, I'll die and, and be, because, you know, a bunch of other theories. Do you really want to believe the theory that some other theory that this time it won't work? Or perhaps you're a, you're a, a, um, a doctor and you have to treat a patient. You, 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 you have to choose what is surely the best theory in these circumstances. Is not this world, um, this realm that Popper is imagining a, 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 of pure science in a way, um, a kind of luxury that most people don't have. Most people have to be inductivist in some way. Well, mate, well everybody has to make decisions, uh, whether it's a medical treatment or a decision about which theory uh, you're going to work on to test experimentally. Uh, but the thing is that, that one reason of having a whole community of scientists is that different scientists can be working on different theories. Not one science doesn't one science doesn't have to do everything. So uh, I just don't see where inductivism comes into it. Uh, it depends what you mean by inductivism, mm. I have to say, really and truly. It, I, when listening to our here, I kept saying, well, what he's calling an induction, it's, he's talk, just talking about making conjectural decisions. That we live oh. in a world of uncertainty, and so an element of conjecture. And then, of course, he said, well, I'm not conjecturing about sitting on this chair. I know I'm sitting on this chair. Well, in extremis, people have hallucinations. Uh, and of course, Papa and Papa says, "Well, people can be deluded about stuff. They have mountaineers who get struck by lightning and don't quite know where they are for a while. Uh, and you think you know how many fingers you've got on your hand, but Papa says, if a, the life of someone depended on getting the number right, you'd probably take your hand out of your pocket and count them again. Um, it's a question of how much checking 
you want to do or how much checking you've got time to do to form a really solid critical preference based on a lengthy examination as opposed to the less rigorous process that we use like deciding what we're going to have for lunch or Mm. or for that matter which doctor we'll go to out of a selection see that was my reading of of um of over here as well that what does he mean by inductivism and i i think it it, it does hit in both directions i i think the a central point in, in that book of his and it probably didn't come through as clearly as we would have hoped in the podcast was that um he believes that many modern day popperians um are not imagining modern day inductivists that in modern day inductivists are not the original variety that think repetitions produce truth but they are people that um um hinge on inductive inferences i think the word again this is this this is a language game of a kind and he's saying it's important to notice regularities and irregularities <laughs> are, are extremely important to have and to find in the world and they are not of of zero value and i i i think you're right on that point that he he is um he is asking the question, and it is an important point of, of just what an inductivist is. And I think often we're speaking past people on these points. Yes, I, I, I think I'd, I'd be inclined if I was asked, if I was talking with Anthony over here, I'd just say, well, why don't, why don't you just experimentally use my language? I'll talk about uh, conjectures rather mm. than inferences or inductive inference. Just talk about conjectures. Uh, it's really and move on and just and again what what it comes back to what, what's the problem we're talking about and so 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 much philosophical talk doesn't engage with actual scientific situations it's, um, sometimes they invent up funny situations to to describe to make their point but it's just so it's, they're just trying to make up increasingly outlandish situations to make some refined philosophical point that's got right away from real life and real science. Let, let's talk about the actual decisions that scientists have to make. Well, on that, let's jump back into real science then. And let's jump back into um, the social turn. And um, I think perhaps it's a good way of leading us back into it and hopefully tying it all together and, and talking in more in depth about what Javi and Tulloch said. Um, I, I should ask, how much of an influence on Popper in this regard were the Austrians, people like Menger and Hayek? That, that's a question I really wanted to know, but I didn't get far enough into the Austrians while Popper was still alive, and I never got to ask him. Um, the short... The, the one, he, he did, in the, in the Poverty of Historicism, refer to a collect, Menger's collected essays, uh, which are in German. I've not seen them translated, so I don't know what is in that book of Menger's collected essays, but he did refer to it, but he never referred to Menger's major, or his, either of his two major books. Uh, as against that, the ideas of the Austrians were floating around Vienna at the time, you know, through the coffee shops and all, the out, all of the avenues of discussion that existed in that dynamic cauldron of ideas. So. But the short answer, I don't, I don't know how much he was influenced by the Austrians because he, he only referred to that book. And he, of course, he learned a lot from Hayek in correspondence, but he never did enough in economics to be sure where his ideas on economics were coming from. Do we, um, do we have leadership? in science in a way because most people have an idea that there are you know there's always figures at the tops of their professions in some ways so do we have um leaderships inside the science as well of course the, this is a dangerous question when you say this as a pop parent it takes you back to plato and his philosopher king and things like this but in some um at least colloquial way in ways we understand science people imagine it with certain titans of the field and certain leaders whose opinions are valued more than others. But um, of course, that seems to defy a, a Popperian approach where, sh and that, that example of Deutsch's at the start, where it's entirely equal and open. Oh, the, the leadership is ubiquitous. There, there are always leaders, and sometimes there's good leadership and sometimes not. Uh, but, um, no, people like 
like Med, well, people like Einstein and, and Bohr and Medawar and Eccles were clearly leaders and they were leaders based on achievement, on, on work done. Uh, other leaders might have get their big true political connections or by their personality or by luck. Uh, but there's certainly there is leadership, but like as in political leadership, the question is, well, how good is it? <laughs> uh, where are they leading us? And and how and how and the other thing is, well, what what are the avenues for challenging the leadership? And of course, in, in Deutsch's example, that was a very egalitarian community, which was a kind of one that I knew 50 years ago, where even the world leaders would would listen at listen to these post-grad students. They didn't just ignore them. Uh, or some postgraduate students are very bright and they're going to become leaders themselves. Uh, so it's a good idea to listen to them. Uh, but the, answer, the short answer is there's leadership all the time. Uh, just a question of how good it is and, and, and how much damage it does if it's, if it's allowed to, if they have too much power. What does the... Um this this institution of science that we're speaking about. Um, actually, I might open this question up with a quote, and this is Popper. He says, only a minority of social institutions are consciously designed while the vast majority have just grown as the undesigned results of human ac actions. And for many people, this, this is a very um, close to Popper's idea of evolutionary knowledge. But the very next sentence, and this is you, you write, Javi is prepared to challenge this. So take us to to that important place there, this idea of these institutions growing um, organically without a, a conscious design. And um, how or why Javi thinks that this is not the case? Oh, he didn't so much think it's not the case. He just thought that, I, well, I, I inserted this, that over the last couple of hundred years, there's been a lot more there's been a massive amount of, enge of engineering, conscious engineering of institutions has been done uh, because people have made it their, it's like the socialist central, central planners, for example, have made it their business to design economies centrally with or without success. Um, the principle is valid in the sense that these institutions start off uh, and well, they, they start off small and they grow, and as they grow, they become more complex. And as they become more complex, it actually gets harder for anybody to design to to keep them under control. <coughs> but my point about Javi was that <coughs> that there has been a, an ongoing there's an ongoing effort to consciously improve institutions with and sometimes that I don't know and it's always constantly but that's an evolution well, as you said it's an evolutionary process but there's been so much conscious effort put into design of institutions in the last century or two that you sort of wonder well okay that that's a, we've come a long way from the time when these things were completely undesigned because so many people are busy at present trying to redesign them. The, so speaking about institutions and design, um, inside the institution of science, uh, there is some um, dispute about how pure this, this this is, depending on which pop parent you speak to. So it, is, is it enough simply to have a space of free criticism where we open our ideas up to as much testing as possible? Or do we need other institutions available or at least created inside them, certain ethical standards inside it? Um, I think it was Tulloch again in his book was talking about this. And he said, if you speak to any scientist and ask them what they do, they will very quickly start to um, speak a bit to you about the, the ethics of, of investigation and the ethics of experimentation and the ethics of this and the ethics of that. It, it always squeals from their mouths. And yet there's also an understanding out there that perhaps um, the real ethics, it, it really doesn't matter how ethical the, the individual scientist is, as long as the, as long as it's open to criticism. So uh, how, how, how important are other moral institutions in this? Well, scientists are just people who, who do certain activities that we call science in, a, in 
a part of our scientific our society that we call universities or laboratories. Um, not that their subject, well, that the question is, I guess, uh, what is the what emerges from this? Okay, so that an atom an atom bomb emerged, um, or maybe you have biological weapons that emerge. So, um, but I think Popper's point was that the and he wrote an essay about the moral responsibility of the scientist, and he said that they they only have or they have particular, but they have the same moral responsibility as every citizen, you know, to pay their taxes and obey the road rules. But the, the, the particular responsibility as scientists arises from the fact that they are maybe the only people who can envisage the implications of growth of knowledge. So the man in the street's got no idea what might evolve out of uh, research on viruses or research on atomic energy, but the scientists can have a can envisage or should be envisaging what might emerge. So that's their their moral responsibility is to to use what they know, essentially to to warn people and to warn governments where something dodgy can something bad can emerge out of this. Or alternatively, they can do what Einstein said. And look, we've got to, we have to develop this bomb before the Germans do. Uh, they they can give positive incentives to do something that they're not doing. Or alternatively, they can be told to pull back. This is too dangerous. But that's a that's a moral responsibility of scientists that it only arises because they got particular knowledge that other people don't have. So should should science um, function as a a model? Or um, for, or I guess, yeah, a model for the open society, or is this a, a, a too easy of a leap? Well, in, in a utopian, or in a well, not just not so utopian, in a, in a broad sense, that's okay. Uh, we, you can think about so people talk about we want a problem-solving society, which means that we want people who bring broadly, given that science is about solving problems. And if you're trained as a scientist, you should theoretically be good at or at least trained in solving problems. So the thought is, okay, we want our whole society to, we want everyone to be better at problem solving. So in some sense, everybody might gain from a good introductory course to uh, scientific investigation, provided that it's a, a, Popper, a Popperian course and not an inductivist course. That's my joke about that. So. And that's what makes science or the badness of science education so frustrating that every nowadays in most countries they, people are supposed to learn something about science at school, but generally speaking, they don't learn enough to participate in a scientific discussion after school. And they don't, generally don't learn get an inkling, the remotest inkling of what it is about science that enables it to grow. They just get told about great scientists they get they might get to make measurements in the lab and learn this and that but it's an unsolved problem to get to convey two things effectively to convey enough science for the general population to actually talk about scientific matters that's unresolved the other thing is to convey a sense of what scientists actually do or don't do and the uh, what to be realistic about what you expect science to do, uh, which means that you wouldn't be held up with hope that just spending more money uh, will actually solve more problems. Is part of the problem here, um, um, and I'm literally speaking into the darkness here as, as a non scientist and asking you about, as a man with a considerable background in science, is one of the problems here that actual scientists every day in the labs, um, despite um, going through the behaviours that Karl Popper spoke about, um, don't understand them explicitly. And if you ask the average scientist how does science work, they'd probably give you a bad answer, something that was empiricist or inductivist or something like that. Yeah, well, it, 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 generally speaking, it's not something they've ever thought about. They just 
they, they do well in science at school and then they think, oh, I'll go and do ag science and solve world hunger problem. And then they log by good chance into an elite institution so they meet lots of good scientists, but they could just as well lob into a a B-grade research institution where everybody's just collecting data and hoping that something will emerge out of it. So uh, it's just a matter of... Sorry, what was the the original problem? I've lost lost my thread of thought. About... um... Um, you were you're talking about the problem with science education and I was saying is one of the problems here that most scientists um, actually don't understand how science works just oh, doing yeah. it every day. Well, that, that's, that's, that's essentially Meadow, Meadow War, of course, had excelled as a scientist and he also got, became thoroughly in, 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 imbued with Popper's philosophy and he's, he's written probably the best, him, him and... Richard Feynman would be the two outstanding exponents of what science is about. Feynman is so Popperian that it hurts. He's never heard about Popper. Uh, but Feynman, Feynman disparages what he calls cargo cult science. Now, do you know about the Melanesian cargo cults? I do not know. Okay. Well, this, this was in the, when the American army was going through the Pacific They'd land on an island and they'd bulldoze the trees and make a landing strip and then the aeroplanes would come in and they'd unload heaps and heaps of cargo. And the, the, the people, the islanders, they thought, this is good. Uh, what if we clear some space in the jungle and we'll have a little hut there and we'll sit in that with a thing on our head that looks like a headphone and we'll wait for... And they formed cults where, they, where cargo was going to come from the gods, and it was going to land. They, they went through the motions of what these Americans did in the hope that the cargo would come as a result of their activities. Like, and Popper and Feynman says, well, so much science is done. That they've looked at physics and they see that physicists collect lots of data and then they learn lot, they apply lots of mathematics to it. Uh, and a moment, and then end up here. You end up with Newton's theory or Einstein's theory. So the social sciences are busy trying; they're emulating the ac- actions of scientists. They, they they accumulate data, they build mathematical models, but they they don't understand the point of exercise. They're just not they're just not addressing the problem in the way that the islanders weren't addressing the problem. They're just going through the motions. Of doing something, and and so Feynman, I think, was very acute with his description. Uh, it's no good going through the motions of what you what think science is about, like collecting data and then running regression models. You've got to work out what the problem is and what's the best line of approach. What are the what are the competing theories? Uh, you don't just Inductive, yeah, in classical inductivism, it lends itself to the cargo cult approach because it just looks like you collect lots of data and then you find patterns in it, and then you, that ends up being knowledge, uh, and that it just doesn't work. I I must ask you about the social sciences and and how they are. So uh, you've all you already um as you know explained a, 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 a dim view or a you know a darkening view of the natural sciences and how that appears in the world. How do you view the social sciences? Because you know going back to Talek's book written in 1966, he has a fairly positive view of the natural sciences. It goes back to a time when you probably had a, a very positive view around the similar yeah, era. Exactly. And uh his last chapter before he has some suggestions, he titles the backwardness of the social sciences, and he's got an incredibly dim view of the social sciences. So how do you view that today and how that sits? Well, he he, he was doing social sciences. That was his profession. And so he could see what was going on in the social sciences, it, peripheral to economics. He was set, focused on economics, but he obviously was aware of what was going on in, around. And he could see that all of the factors that were had not yet started to corrode and undermine the natural sciences, those factors were in full flight in his experience in 
the softer sections of the social sciences, although he might, and he might have thought the parts of economics hadn't con, con, weren't too bad, and he also thought at that time that the natural sciences were okay. Uh, but of course, that was early days, and the worm was just starting to turn, as he wrote. Uh, so, again, you've got a situation where uh, thousands, tens of thousands of people are doing research. Uh, it's a very well. There's very little. Let's say there's very little. There's very little critical analysis going on, even when it's called critical theory. It's not really critical, it's only critical of other theories. And I don't, I just gave, gave up in despair. I just walked away from sociology. I practically had a nervous breakdown. I just couldn't handle it. Um, I don't know how you retrieve it. Is it is part of the problem? Uh, this is complete speculation here. Is part of the problem that um, the science, natural sciences, the natural sciences have some um, um, methodological advantages of the social sciences in, in terms of the ability to isolate certain elements within the um, laboratory and, and uh, you know correct for some um, irregularities here or there? Is 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 there some reason why we should expect? Um, beyond that, if it's not that, is there some reason why should we should expect this continued lagging of the social sciences to be um, anywhere near as rigorous as the natural sciences? Well, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm speaking as a spectator at this stage. I have, apart from uh, getting in, engaged in climate science recently, I'm, I'm very distant from uh, what's going on in the. That in the social sciences, I just well, you can't ignore it, um, but it, it just seems to have gone completely crazy. Um, uh, it's just totally driven by politics. I mean, that, that's that's the worm in the apple through and through. That, that everything has become politicised, so, and and particularly in the social sciences, it's well documented that. Conservatives have been practically driven out of the social sciences. That the the, the numbers in the faculty would be in the, in the ratio of ninety percent to ten percent or wider, where conservatives are just shrunk to such a tiny fraction of the community that they they've even driven. There's a, a publication called Quillette, which is they call it the dark web. There's people people can publish in Quillette anonymously and just get stuff into print that they couldn't publish in any of the regular journals in the field. It just wouldn't be accepted or they'd be drummed out of the profession if people knew they were thinking those kind of things. If you were, I, I'm just conscious of time here and looking at where we're at, I, before we get to the end of a few things, um, if you were to um, improve some things i mean as you're talking about the social sciences there and you, clearly some of the politics has, has has taken over these some of the politics a lot of politics has taken over the social sciences it doesn't sound anything like deutsch's ideal community that i mentioned at the start of this and you're saying of course um science is drifting in the same way so it, if we were to tweak a few small things we've mentioned things like um um the peer peer review process, which which appears broken, the funding question, which appears broken, is 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 there some other way, or is 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 if is there some other way to imagine a, a small incentive here or there that might improve? I mean, Talek talks, as I mentioned, a lot about prizes and um, prestige, and uh, when I read that, it, it sounded slightly um hopeful that people are going to be um motivated in this way, but maybe maybe they are, and I'm too out of touch with pure science. So um, are there any small fixes, so to speak, that, that, that might be able to make changes in the long run? Well, the only, I can't, I don't know what to do about institutions of science, but I, I do, I, I think that a better, if, if more people got a good introduction to critical rationalism, Essentially, the method of pop now expounded by Popper. That would have to have a salutary effect. Uh, just for example, my wife did a second-year unit philosophy of science, 
at Sydney University, which is probably the most prestigious university in Australia. And in this second year unit in philosophy of science, there was no mention of Popper. Uh, and when she asked about Popper at my request, the lecturer said, oh, Popper was just one of the logical positivists. So it comes back to that. that you, have to, you have to imagine where physics would be uh, if Einstein's ideas had just been totally marginalised and never got taught a standard part of science. Like, where, where would physics be if there has been no Einsteinian revolution because no one would teach Einstein's thoughts? Uh, and, that, and so philosophy science has been conducted now as though Popper never existed uh, because he's not being taught or he's being misrepresented as a logical positivist in philosophy. So there you go. What, what can be, what, there's a thought experiment. Imagine mm -hmm. that science without Popper, which is the way it is because he's not taught effectively, and imagine physics without Einstein, I don't know where you'd be. Uh, but you wouldn't, presumably you wouldn't be where we are, you'd be somewhere else. <laughs> I must run one idea past you. Um, and I got this from Tulloch again, and I must, I, I hadn't heard of Gordon Tulloch until about six or seven months ago, I was reading through your blog and I noticed you'd written a lot about how important he was. And I think you said he, he's the, uh, the greatest uh, the greatest economist never to win a Nobel Prize, something along those lines. And, like that, and I, I, it's just a wonderful uh, book called The Organisation of Inquiry. And um, I was reading through it and he had a, an, an idea in there, which, which and I might run it past you and, and tell me is, it, it, to, to me, it sounded like a, a very promising one. And, um, you know, me and Gordon might be uh, the wrong people to be thinking about this, uh, people in the social sciences. And he said it, it, perhaps the whole publishing, so he, 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 he spoke about the publishing um, aspect and these journals and said this is the most important aspect, that we can disseminate our ideas. And then once you've disseminated them, they are open for criticism. It's not that they are then true. It's that this is the first real step, not the last. And this is the most important step. And he said, perhaps one of the most important things we could do is demand that journals begin not just to show us what they publish, but to show us everything that they reject. And then you could get a clear understanding of how many papers they reject and compared to how many they're publishing. And, um, and, and, and also we had an understanding of their biases. So if they're rejecting all sorts of papers from one particular um, viewpoint, then you'd see that. And if there's, if, 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 if there's a wonderful paper that's been published by some leading physicist, you could see all the journals that rejected it first before it was finally published. Oh, I think that's, that's, that's absolutely brilliant. I don't actually remember seeing that in the book, but that's, that is brilliant because uh, in, in another context, I've seen a description of, of path-breaking papers that were only published by the second, third, fourth or fifth journal that they were sub submitted to uh, and so having a record of a public record of that would be immensely valuable uh, and um, thank thanks for bringing that up I hadn't I'd completely forgotten about that idea but look I, before we finish I really do want to tell you a, a, an anecdotal story a story about relationship between Popper and Tulloch please please yeah uh, now for all of Tulloch's fulsome uh, acknowledgement of Popper's influence, uh, Popper never mentioned anything about Popper, sorry, no, Popper never mentioned anything about Tulloch in anything he ever wrote. Uh, and that is despite, and that actually applies to other Popperians, the only thing about Tulloch I've seen is a footnote in a, a paper by Joe Agassi. And Joe Agassi was... Popper's research assistant for several years during a period when Popper and Tulloch exchanged probably 10 or 20 or 30 letters. A, few, a very big and sustained correspondence uh, after the time that they met at a conference in the United States. And one of, a lot of the stuff that Tulloch was writing about, apart from the vicissitudes of his career where he couldn't succeed in setting up an institute funded by the Ford Found the Rockefeller Foundation because they didn't like him. Um, a lot of his letters were trying to persuade Popper to take up some of Tulloch's ideas in apropos of physics. So um, 
which Papa couldn't, he, he very tactfully put it, but he, he didn't. He's very polite, but he obviously didn't want to have anything to do with these ideas about physics coming from Tulloch. And in fact, I've joked on other occasions that he probably might have got the Nobel Prize if he hadn't wasted so much of his mental energy trying to convince Popper stuff about physics. Uh, but that, I think that's just remarkable that there's so much value in Tulloch's book, which was inspired by Popper, and Popper and no other Popper Arian ever bothered to mention the relationship or what was in Tulloch's book. I find that stupefying, but everybody died. Everyone was gone who were alive at that time before I ever found out about this. So I can't ask them, look, why didn't you say more about it? <laughs> well, if Agassiz hadn't mentioned it and you hadn't written about it, I would never have found it either. It's one of those um, difficult things in the world. Um, I, 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 I have to ask you a last question then um, on that. Um, and it, it is in the final pages of your article on this. Um, it's my understanding, certainly of Javi's book, um, The Republic of Science, but also of Tulloch's, that they weren't very widely received. Um, oh, uh, no. There's, to use the phrase that Hume applied to one of his books, they, they fell stillborn from the press. <laughs> so why do you think that was? Is, 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 is it just a little dry, the topic, and people are interested in different things? Or is there a better way? So you have this wonderful website called The Rat House, which I, I, I read all the time. It's by far the best um, uh, Popperian resource on the web and also leads you into other great thinkers like Bartley that most people don't write about today. Um, and, and I'm trying my very little bit with this podcast here. So it, if, if attempts like these great books fall flat on their face, uh, what should we be doing? How is it? Because it, once you get the philosophy, it seems to make so much sense to so many people, but it, it doesn't seem to cut through in the first place. So um, do you have any, 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 any hopes or, or, or ways forward that we, we should be pushing that? Well, I think what, what I've done to, to help is to reduce, for example, a seven or 800 page Open Society to Enemies to our 55 pages, which one of our young popper people is reading to create a podcast. So it'll be beautifully read, 55 page introduction to that major work. So the thing is to produce, essentially to use social media, to use social media, what that is, podcasts and videos, uh, to, to disseminate Popper's work through alternative channel, channels other than the academic channels. There's a great hunger out there for learning. There's, I'm told that there's money to be made from courses on practically anything. If you, if you think you know something about something, you can put do a, run a course on social media and maybe make even make money out of it as, as you're doing with your podcast. That's a case in point that... Uh, and, and so I'm just hoping that there will be a, a, um, a resurgence of Popper's ideas driven by younger people using social media and inspired by the Rat House, because no doubt that the Rat House has inspired quite a number of people, nowhere near enough, but anyway, it's there, it's, it's alive, it's, it survives. It's a, reason, it's a matter of channelling people too, it's a matter of more people finding it, uh, and you can help people to do that. And you won't be on your own. That 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 is a hopeful message to leave the podcast on. And of course, for listeners, I will link to the Rat House website. Um, I'm not embellishing; I read it all the time. If you go searching for critical rationalism sites and resources across the web, and Popperian sites and resources across the web, you're almost immediately going to come to that central resource, and it has so much there. Um, of course, I'm also going to link to um, Rafe's paper that we spoke about today and um, Rafe's other articles and books that you can find online as well, as well as some of the books that we referenced today, such as Javi's book and Tulloch's book as well. Um, on that, it, it really is such a rare pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you for having me. I'm so grateful. <laughs>